So one of the first big questions that we get is what exactly is the Casper Suite? Well, the Casper Suite consists of two main components, one being the server side, the other being the application suite. On the server side, we have the JSS, the Jamf Software Server. This is the management console, the server, where things are configured to be sent out to the client machine. This can be installed on Windows Server, Mac OS X, and pretty much any flavor of Linux. We also offer a hosted cloud environment where we handle all the server optimization, all the configurations, so you don't have to worry about it. After logging into the Jamf Software Server, the JSS, the first thing you see is the JSS dashboard. This is kind of your favorites view of things that you put here that are most important to you in your environment, things that you want to keep the closest tabs on, so you can see the status of packages being deployed, settings being set, see the status of File Vault 2 encrypted machines. One of the second biggest questions we get right away is, how do I get machines into the Jamf Software Server? How do I get them managed? How do I get Macs that are already out in my organization in the creative team and the development? How do I get those managed? How do I get new machines that I get off the truck or I buy from the Apple store? Does IT have to take them, do something special, and then hand it back to the users? While we have a lot of different ways to do that, one of the most popular methods we see recently, especially in the commercial and enterprise sectors, is the self-enrollment method. So self-enrollment is where you direct a user to a URL. They come here, log in with either an Active Directory account that they already have, or if you want to put a static user in the JSS to do this. They come in here, put credentials that they already know that they use for other things in your organization. They log in. You can assign on behalf of a user. Click Enroll. Download this megabyte and a half package. Double click it. About 20 seconds later, they're into the system. All right, so they're managed, they're enrolled. What does that mean? Well, two things happen right away. One, you get an inventory of the machine that's managed. So let's say, for example, Adam's MacBook Air here. We get some general information of, okay, it's Adam's MacBook Air. This is his IP address. Is it managed? The JSS computer ID. And then we have hardware information. Uh, what's the make? What's the model? What's on it? What type of processor? How much RAM? We get to see the operating system. What version is it? Is it bound to Active Directory? Yes or no? User and location information? Uh, I'll skip over that. That's real information. That's tying directly into our Active Directory at Jamf Software. This will pull in any information that you already have set up in Active Directory. It'll pull it right into inventory. Purchasing information, if you tie into Apple's Apple Care or GSX. Storage information, the hard drive, the smart status. The disk encryption status of that hard drive. Is it encrypted? What are the keys if we need them? Applications, application version. You can see the list kind of goes on and on and on. We essentially collect anything that the Unix system can see, and we inventory it. So I said two main things happen right away when a user enrolls. One, from your point of view, you get to inventory. You get to you know, do reports keep track of what you have in your environment. The other thing that happens is from the end user point of view, they get self-service. So after they enroll, they put in their username and password, they double click, 20 seconds later, they're managed. Again, they can log in with either a static username and password that you want to set up ahead of time, or if you're using Active Directory, they log in with the credentials that they know and use for everything else. Once they log into self-service, they see this. Self-service is essentially your own personal app store that you control as a corporation. So anything that an end user sees in here is because you put it there and you told them they have access to it. So the one you're looking at right now is actually Jamf Softwares. Uh, this isn't a demo version. This isn't a pre-canned one. This is the one that I use at work every day. So what I see here is a list of applications or utilities or operating systems that I can use to do my job. So if I need HipChat, or I need to get BoxSync, or if I need to grab a piece of software, I can just come into self-service, click install, and I have it. I don't have to contact IT. I don't have to open up an IT ticket, ask for serialization. I don't have to do requests to get this. If it's something that I deserve as an employee or is allocated to me in my department, it'll show up in self-service. Same goes for other non-application workflows, like printers, for example. When I need to get a printer, I don't have to open up an IT ticket, ask IT for you know a USB drive for the drivers, or, or go to a, a URL and download it myself. I just go right into self-service and find the printers that I need. The ones that I'm seeing right now for Cupertino, Eau Claire, and Minneapolis, and New York, this is because my network location is based in the U.S. 
If I was to travel over to Europe or Australia or Hong Kong, I would see a different set of printers because based on my inventory and who I am in the company, where I am, different things will show up for my needs. Another thing we do at Jam Software is we offer tier one support in self-service. And what I mean by that is under this help tools section, we have this big red easy button. So what this does is allows the end user to, when they think their machine is running slow or they wanna open up an IT ticket to see what's going on, they come in here first, click run on this big red easy button and see if that fixes it. Now in the background, what's actually happening is our IT department created a few scripts that flush caches, fix permissions, do some of that tier one support that we would do anyway. And we allow the end user to get that done. So if that fixes it, great, we save an IT ticket. Now, not everything can be fixed with this big red easy button and end users will still need to open up IT tickets from time to time. For that process, we can put that in self-service as well. On the left-hand side, we have these plugins. So these plugins can give the end user access to different things in the company that they need, whether it be 401k, HR related things, or IT tickets. We can put that right on the left-hand side. So self-service ends up becoming their one-stop shop for pretty much anything they need in the company. So while self-service will be here for you know help tools, printers that they need, applications that they need to get, we also have things dependent on your role in the company. So as a systems engineer, I see a lot of operating systems for testing that I need to do for server side, client side. Now, if I was logged in as someone in the company who's in the creative department, I probably wouldn't see operating systems. I'd see things like Adobe Photoshop, InDesign. So it depends on who you are in the company, what your inventory on the machine is, and what you need to do your job. Those things are what determine what an end user will see in self-service. So again, after a user enrolls, two main things happen. From the IT point of view, you get inventory of the machine. You can track what's out there in your environment. From the end user's point of view, they get self-service. They get access to the applications, the printers, and the utilities they need to do their job. So for you, while inventory is important, you can do reporting on it, you can keep track of what's out there. You can also take action based on the inventory of a machine. How we do that is with smart computer groups. Smart computer groups are groups of machines based on a set of criteria that you define, and the group memberships dynamically update throughout the lifespan of all the machines in your environment. As an example, I'll show you a File Vault 2 one I have set up. So for criteria, I have File Vault 2 status is all partitions are encrypted or the boot partitions are encrypted. So this will show me what machines in my environment are File Vault 2 encrypted. I can view them. I can do a report on them. I can take action on it. I can say, edit a bunch of information on these computers. Or if I want to create report out of this information. So smart computer groups are great for doing reporting or keeping track of inventory of your environment. They're even better as actionable items. Policies are first up. Policies are kind of the meat and potatoes, the bread and butter, the, the main powerful stuff that we do. So what is a policy? Policies are where we set up actions to happen to a client machine. So in a policy, we have these triggers. So this is saying when something's going to happen. Is it going to happen at startup, at login, log out, when their network state changes? Or is it going to happen as soon as they enroll? So this enrollment complete trigger ties back into the end user self-enrollment. This allows you to have important things happen as soon as someone enrolls. So you could actually take imaging out of the environment and use the enrollment complete trigger as the important items. Instead of erasing a drive, putting on the important things that you need to during imaging, you can say, hey, as soon as someone enrolls, kick off the 8021X Wi-Fi profile for them to get the certificate so they can connect to our network. Kick off the file vault to encryption so that we know they're encrypted. You can put all the important things that you normally put in an image, instead of having to grab it, image it, hand it back, just have that happen in the background as soon as someone enrolls. So a trigger is when something's gonna happen. We have execution frequency of how often it's gonna happen. Is it gonna be once, once per user, once per week? Is it a maintenance task? Packages would be software. Let's say we wanna install Adobe Acrobat. We wanna install Google Chrome. This is where we would set a package to install. We want to make sure that they're up to date with all the software updates. This is where you can define, hey, use the default Apple software update server that your machine already uses. 
Do we want to use a specific software update server that we use in our environment? You can point the users to wherever you'd like. If you want to run a script, set up printers, set up disk encryption, doc items, again, you can see the list kind of goes on and on. These are the deliverables of what we ha want to happen to the end machine. Now you saw we have software updates. We use software update server. We also have disk encryption with File Vault 2. This is important as Jamf software tries to tie in with Apple's native tools whenever possible. This allows us to do day one support for new Apple operating systems when they come out. When we tie into native Apple tools, those protocols update with new operating systems, which allow us to update it with it as well. So while we have when something's going to happen with the trigger, how often something's going to happen with execution frequency, then we say what's going to happen to the machine. With the scope tab, we say who it's going to happen to. So this is where smart computer groups come into play. If we want to add a specific computer, you know, just a one-off for one person, or a couple specific computers, or we want it to happen to a computer group. So let's say we only want to install Firefox, but we only want to install Firefox to 10.7 workstations or 10.6 workstations. This will pull directly from the smart computer groups that you have set up. So while the machines in your environment update their inventory, they'll fall into different computer groups. So you can see it starts to become a set it and forget it mentality of initially we're going to set up certain things to happen to certain computer groups. And then when they fall into those inventory buckets, that is going to happen. So that's how we take action on smart computer groups and the inventory of a device. Now, all of this is assuming that we want something to happen in the background. We want this to automatically happen to the end user. They don't have to do anything to get it. They don't have to go to self-service to get this application or something that's important. We're just pushing it out to happen. Now, if it's a policy we do want in self-service, it's just this checkbox. Without this checkbox, we're intending this policy, this action to happen in the background. With this checkbox, it's in self-service. It's the end user's option of when to get it or when they need it. You can also combine these two methods of having it sent out in the background and also in self-service. One way we do this at Jamf Software is with File Vault 2 encryption. Now, File Vault 2 encryption is usually severely important or it's part of compliance, so it needs to get done. However, it's also a very CPU and hard drive intensive task. So what we do is we put it in self-service for a certain amount of time. We don't want to interrupt your day-to-day -day work. We don't want to interrupt a keynote presentation and suddenly your slides are laggy and you wonder what's going on. Well, what's going on is your machine is encrypting its hard drive in the background. So what we say is when you have time, when your computer is not being used for something you know, public facing or severely important, encrypt your machine with File Vault 2 in self-service. Now, we could put a time limit on that and say, again, because it's an important thing, it's, it's File Vault 2 encryption, you have two weeks to get to it, so get to it when you can. But if you don't get to it within two weeks, we're just going to kick it off automatically in the background and you don't have a choice anymore. So while policies are the main deliverable for scripts, packages, software update servers, actionable things, we also tie into configuration profiles. Configuration profiles are similar to policies in it's something we want to happen to the end machine, but this is more on the settings side. Setting up passcodes, network configuration, VPN, certificate, SCEP. Again, we say what we want to happen, and then scope is who we want it to happen to. Again, it'll be specific computer groups, specific computer, and if we want to add a computer group that we have already in the environment based on the inventory, we'll have this kick off as soon as that machine falls into this group. So restricted software is pretty self-explanatory. But what we're doing here is we're looking for a certain process name that we want to restrict in our environment. And once we find that process, we can do a number of things. We can send an email notification to you or the IT admin so you know when someone's using something they're not supposed to. We can kill the process. We can delete the application when we find it happening. And again, we're using the scope method. So we're saying either one computer, all computers, or a certain set of computer groups. While we might want to restrict Photoshop on a few people's machine, we definitely don't want to do it on the whole creative team. So you'll see that we start using the scoping method in everything that we do. All the settings, all the packages, all the deliverables. We get full control and granular control of who this is going to happen to. The same workflow falls into Mac App Store apps. If we want to tie into Apple's native App Store, we can put those in self-service as well. Same with eBooks. So on the Jamf software server side, we went through the inventory of a machine, policies, sending out deliverables, 
configuration profiles, again, a deliverable, but on the systems, the setting side of things, restricting software, and how we do all of this with smart computer groups. We take action on inventory. As inventory changes, things will happen to different machines based on where they are in the life cycle of that machine. As far as the applications that come along with the Casper Suite, first up is Composer. This is the package building tool. This is where you can create software packages, PKG, DMG out of browsers, Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop, or if you want to custom deploy how software will look on the end user's machine. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. One would be a snapshot method. This is where you can essentially take a picture of the machine at its current state. Then from there, you would install the software, change the settings that you want to package up. Afterwards, you would take the second snapshot. Composer would then compare what happened between those two snapshots and build a package out of it. Build OS package. This is for creating operating system images to be used with Casper imaging or other imaging tools. This will look at other partitions connected to the machine that's running Composer and let you select which image you'd like to build from. Now we have these couple options called pre-installed software and user environment. This will look at the machine that you have right now and you can build packages out of what you already have on that machine. Why we have this is a lot of people will create software packages or test software on an IT machine to see if it's right for the user environment, to see what we want to have them use, and to have it set up how we want the end user to see it. So we can say, I've made Google Chrome on here exactly how I want the end users to see it. I've skipped the intro message of, hey, do you want to make this your default browser? Um, imported the bookmarks. All those settings in the beginning when you first launch it that are sometimes a little bit annoying. So it'll look at my machine, see what I have installed on here and we can make packages out of it. It's looking on your system for what you have for settings, the actual application, the app, and it'll show you a file structure of what's actually on your machine. So we can go through here, do more editing if you like to certain plists, depending on what you already have set up. Once we're happy with what we have, we can build it as either a DMG or a PKG. I'll build this one as a DMG. It asks you where to save it. We'll save it on the desktop. And it's creating a DMG of Google Chrome based on exactly what's on this machine. So any settings I already have for my user, how I want the end user to see it, it's going to grab those settings and bake it right into the DMG. So while we did that with a package, we can also do that with the user environment, the settings that we have. Again, we can use configuration profiles or some of the default settings and policies we have in the JSS. Or we can create things based on how we want our end user to see it from this machine that I'm looking at now. So I have a certain company desktop pattern that I'd like, or I have the dock set how I like it, or I have a combination of a few of these. I can say, this is how I want the end user's desktop and dock to look, and build a package based out of those settings. Again, it'd be the same as, okay, I want to build one out of this. Next, show you the file structure of that actual setting, and you can build it as a DMG or as a PKG to be pushed out later. Casper Admin is the application that's a link between the offline and the online world. So a link between all the packages you built, the settings you have, and how you want to upload them so the JSS sees it and knows what to do with it. I have a few already here in my environment, but how to get these here is as simple as just dragging and dropping. So once I have packages uploaded into Casper Admin, they're not just a repository for things to sit. I can also create configurations. Configurations tie in with our imaging application so that we can make custom configurations for the different departments that we have. And what I mean by that is this parent configuration, we see that we have a 1084 clean DMG. That's an operating system package that I made. It's just the operating system, but it's clean. So I don't have anything added. I have things set very minimalistic how I want my environment so I can layer on top of it. So in this imaging configuration, I'm gonna have 1084 clean, Firefox, and a script to hide the recovery HD. Now, if I want to customize that for the creative team and just add Adobe Flash Player, it's the same set, it's the same clean operating system, it's Firefox, I had that script to hide the recovery HD, but I'm also tossing on Adobe Flash Player. So I didn't have to create a new monolithic image, I can just layer things from Casper Admin into the existing image that I have and push it out for different departments. Customize for development, for support, you have a parent configuration and you can edit it from there. So Casper Admin is the application that creates the link between the offline and the online world and also hooks into Casper Imaging for imaging configurations. Casper Imaging, again, like the other applications, work in tandem with the Jamf software server and communicate with the other applications that we've used. Casper Imaging can be hosted on an external USB drive, a separate partition, 
a separate computer with target mode imaging. It can also be put on your network as a netboot image, so machines can boot over the network and image. We see here is it will select a target drive, depending on what drive you want to actually image, a configuration that we want to select for that group of machines. This is where we see the same that we had in Casper Admin, the creative team, development, support. Again, depending on who's booted into either the netboot or the USB drive, the JSS will see what's on the machine, what department it belongs to, and you can have it auto-select which configuration will image with it. So once the configuration has been selected or auto-selected by the JSS when this launches, on the left-hand side you can see what will be installed. This matches exactly with what's in Casper Admin. Distribution point, this is where it's going to pull that information from. Again, this is what Casper Admin used as well. So Casper Imaging is pretty self-explanatory, it's pretty powerful, it's pretty simple, but it's powerful in its simplicity. It selects the drive you want to image, it selects which configuration based on the information that's in the JSS on that computer's inventory, and it kicks off imaging. This is another enrollment tool we have with the Casper Suite. So initially we showed how users can do self-enrollment via the URL. Casper Recon is simply an application to give additional options on how to do that. You can boot this from a machine and enroll it locally, you can do it based on a remote enrollment, find an IP address, the management account that's on there, enroll it automatically. Create a quick add package to put on a USB drive or emailed out. Or use a network scanner to look for previous management accounts on machines in a range of IP addresses. And last but not least is Casper Remote. Casper Remote is our screen sharing tool. This can be used to screen share into a user's machine if they're having issues and you want to help them with remote support. This can also be used to do a simple push out of a package to one machine, or I want to push out Firefox to test it quick instead of going to the Jamf software server, creating a whole new policy, selecting the options, putting the package, scope it out to just one machine, click go, wait for it to check in. I can just come in here, select the computer that I want to push out a package to, find the package in my environment that I want to push out, click go. So Casper Remote is one of those main tools in an IT admin's toolbox for Macs when they need to do some troubleshooting or quick screen sharing to help out an end user. So there's a quick overview and demonstration of the Casper Suite. I hope it helped answer a lot of questions that you had of what we do, what all comes along with it. Again, the first half we spent with the JSS, the Jamf software server, the management console where packages are configured to be sent out, settings are configured to be sent out, File Vault 2 encryption needs to be sent out. We can do that to one machine, all machines, or a group of machines based on criteria that's important to your environment. If only 10.7 workstations need File Vault 2 encryption, or if 10.8.5 machines need updates every day depending on if they're in the creative team or the development team. We showed how that can be done through policies with sending out in the background, or how it can be done with self-service. If an end user just needs to get an application, they can go into self-service, find what they need, click install. If they're a traveling salesman, they need to get printers depending on where they are in the US or Hong Kong or Australia. Depending on who they are in the company, where they are, they can come in here and get the printers they need. If an end user is experiencing slowdowns or needs to open up an IT ticket, they can come into self-service, click the easy button. That might fix it all. If they need to still find further help, we can plug that into self-service as well with URL plugins. So as you can see, we didn't click on every single icon in the JSS or self-service or the applications. The reason being, there's about 30 different ways to accomplish a lot of the same goals. But I wanted to show what we see most popular, especially in the commercial and the enterprise environment. I wanted to show what we see work the best, what we see most often. But I encourage you to either email us at info at jampsoftware.com or visit our website, www.jampsoftware.com. Let us know if you have any questions or if you want to see anything more. Thanks a lot.